So a little bit of a disclaimer about the slideshow. It's um, basically, I've got over a million photographs in my Game of Thrones career. And it was, it was going to be too hard to pick out like 50 to talk about because the job just, it, it just isn't like, I couldn't do that. So what I've got is I've just tried to pick out a selection that you wouldn't have seen maybe um, a lot of behind the scenes photographs that haven't been used and then the ones that you probably have seen are in there too. Um, but it's just, it's a way for me to kind of illustrate the things that I'm talking about to you if you've never been on a film set. Um, so that'll just roll in the background. There's a few posy shots of me in there, don't laugh. It's trying to show you the equipment. Um, is anybody here uh, film industry? Any, so, are you a stills photographer? Oh, oh, fancy. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm just gonna kind of talk about uh, the, the questions that people ask me the most, and I think that's a good way to format the talk because it means that in the q and I, I hopefully will have answered most people's kind of queries about what this job is because the camera stuff, there's like a whole fleet of geniuses over there that can answer camera questions, but my problem was always, I couldn't find out what people's jobs were when I was trying to Google it. If I wanted to know what the job comprised of, you would Google it and the information just wasn't there. So hopefully I'm gonna fill in those blanks for you today. Hopefully. <laughs> um, so the first thing that people always ask me is, how'd you get that job? How'd you get there? Um, and my answer is always clowns, um, and that's, that's true, it was clowns. I met a whole lot of clowns in a bar one night in Belfast, and they needed a photographer, and I said, oh, I've got a camera, I can take photos, I can, you know, knock together some publicity stuff for you. So I started working with this troop of um, clowns, and they introduced me to some acrobats, and. I traveled around and met a lot of performers and I kind of thought that that was going to be my life, like literally running away and joining the circus, but it uh, hasn't worked out that way. <laughs> it's a bit different, one, one bunch of clowns to another bunch of clowns. But um, they, basically what happened was I was traveling around with these, these performers and actually I've realized now that a lot of what I learned from them has informed my work and practice on Game of Thrones because I juggle my cameras. No, I don't. It's informed my practice because a lot of the ways that you have to work are similar. And I don't know, you can apply this to maybe what to what you do. But um, so things like uh, keeping out of the way. So when there's acrobats there and they're doing a performance, I can't, I don't have free run to just walk right up because I don't know when she's going to, you know, bat her leg out. and you know, everybody could get injured and so you've got to keep, you know you can get your shot from a distance, but also learning their tricks. So knowing when that moment's going to come in the middle of the trick, you know, when is she going to do the backflip, knowing that moment so I can get it and be ready. And that's informed my practice in terms of uh, when, I'm, when I'm photographing stunts, listen carefully to the rehearsals, watch the rehearsals, know exactly what's going to happen and then you'll be better prepared. So th things like that have actually helped me. <laughs> My life in the circus has, um, has helped me a lot. Um, but that doesn't explain how I got the job yet, does it? Just talking about clowns for five minutes. So what happened, and, and the reason I tell this story is it's not immediately obviously helpful to anyone if, who wants to get into the industry, but it's to illustrate the point that this industry and a lot of freelance work is it's not about what you know and what you've achieved it's about who you know and finding ways to kind of you know insinuate yourself into those situations that get you contacts that network you know all that kind of stuff that they don't teach you how to do so so the way that I got into this job was a producer Actually, a, a production assistant saw some of my circus portraits and she thought they were creepy and a bit melancholy and a bit weird. And she recommended them to someone on a movie she was working with that she thought they would look good as props. So I got asked to come in and um, 
shoot the actors in the same way as I'd shot those circus performers. And then they were blown up as great big giant portraits along a corridor in this film. And, uh, you know, I went in and I, I was there and I was doing the portraits and I thought, oh, I've always wanted to do TV photos. And I don't really know what that entails, what that is. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to find the photographer. I'm going to have to pick their brain. So um, thankfully, I asked if I could meet the photographer. And they said, yeah, he's around somewhere. His name is Keith Hampshire. And he's really, you would know his work. He's done loads of Bond, you know. And he's really one of the big guys in stills. And I, I got to meet him. and. I think the most important thing that he did for me was he was so encouraging. Uh, when he saw my portfolio, he said, "I think, I think, you can, oh, here come the, here come the stormtroopers. That's exciting." <laughs> um, so anyway, yes, he said, um, "I think you should go for it." And uh, so I, I, I kind of summoned up the courage to just march up to the producer with my little portfolio that didn't have much in it and just say, I'm Helen Sloan, this is my work, I don't want to work with clowns anymore. And I think he thought I might be crazy. But he took the portfolio and he had a look through it and I didn't hear anything from him for a year. But um, something, I must have popped into his head and he called me up and he said, look, I'm doing these horror films, they're probably straight to DVD but we're cobbling together a crew and maybe, you know, you're a bit goth, you might want to come and come do that. It's a lot of blood. It might, might be exciting, might not. And I was like, yes, I'll do anything. Um, so we went along and shot these horror films and they weren't great, but I built up my portfolio and the work itself was very dark and very difficult. And I think it, I, I jumped in at the deep end in terms of how tricky they were to shoot because it was a lot of gore and action and you know all that late night horror stuff and um, but then the same the same producer came to me then after a while and said look I've got this other thing happening it's wizards and swords and all that kind of nerdy stuff you're into and you know it might not go anywhere it might not turn into anything and that was Game of Thrones so <laughs> It has gone somewhere and it has turned into something. Um, but it was just purely that thing that he thought was a relatively small project and he took a risk on me and it, and it worked out. But the point I'm trying to illustrate is that it's not, there's no formula to get in a job. And I basically kind of fluked my way in, in the beginning. So um, anyway, that's that. That's how I got on Game of Thrones and that was eight and a half years ago. Um, does anybody watch Game of Thrones? Okay, good. If you don't watch it and you were planning on doing a bit of a catch up, there's a lot of spoilers in this slideshow for like, because I mean, it's been on for eight and a half years. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't leave stuff out. But um, yeah, so there's things, just ignore it when you see people with like, you know, knives in their head and stuff. It's just pretend you didn't see that. Um, so the next question I get asked a lot is, what's your average day? Um, and the answer is, there, there is no average day. There's no such thing as an average day, you know. It's um, one day I can be on a lovely warm beach, shooting somebody riding a horse in the surf, and it's gorgeous, and it's sunny, and it's nice. And then the next day I can be on top of a glacier in minus 25, with my fingers are turned grey, you know, it's, or I can be in a, a brothel, not a real one, fake one, TV land one, um, or I can, you know, be in a situation like this, or I can be just shooting a nice wedding scene, which aren't nice in Game of Thrones, for those of you who know, have watched weddings, Game of Thrones. Um, so it's just an average day, there is no average day, because I don't know how it's going to be, and Ireland is not famed for its weather, so that's always a bit of an unknown. Um, so I can I can tell you what I do, what I have to do every day, no matter the situation. So the um, the first thing we do is we get a sort of a menu the night before called a call sheet, 
and it's a, like a sort of a menu of what's going to happen the next day. So, which cast, which location, the rel the action, and if I read down through the different departments, it might say that there's 70 horses there that day. So I'll know that maybe there's an interesting photo to be had down at the paddock, where the horses are being dressed and all their armour, and you know, so I can read through it and I can kind of say, oh, that's. That sounds, I'll go and check that out, or I, I hear that maybe special effects are testing a, a fire explosion, you know, because it'll be on that information sheet. So it's my job to kind of read through all of it and know what's happening. Um, so I got the call sheet, and then the, the day, we usually start shooting at about 8 a.m., that's standard, but we've just done 11 weeks of night shoots, so that's been fun. And but so usually the day starts about eight, and we'll shoot for ten or eleven hours, constant shooting, like constant, constant, constant shooting. And um, I've got my all my gear I've packed up and, and carted up to set in a little trolley. A lot of people's like, oh, what bag do you use? Do you have a pelly case? And it's like, if you've ever tried to drag a hard case through a bog in Ireland, you realise that you need to find something else because that just doesn't work and shoulders don't last forever so I've done away with rucksacks that's like nope can't do it anymore next too sore so I've got this um, you know the little trailers those terrifying things that people have their kids in behind the bicycle it's one of those but it's made for dogs imagine old dogs or something so it's not got a seat so I have modified the bike hitch into a handle and then, well, I didn't do it, the special effects guys did it for me because they can weld. So they've welded a handle onto it for me and it's got like 14 inch bicycle wheels so I can wheel it through these bogs and rivers of horse poo and all these things that are so lovely that we have to do more things in. Um, and so I've got this little cart, it's called the, the Sloan Dog Cruiser. It's been nicknamed. Somebody got me a number plate for it this year, which is nice. Uh, we actually we named it last year at this photography show. Some lady came up with a name for it, so there you go. So I've got my all my gear in the cart. I'll talk about what's in the cart later. Um, so we shoot, 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 and then I'll come home. I will triple back up my images because I'm terrified of losing them. If anybody's ever lost anything on a hard drive, that is just a nightmare. So it's a triple backup system and. You know, there's there's moments in this show. Uh, I mean, if you've you've seen it, there's these big moments, and you know that the fans are itching to get the info. And you know, I have these images, and I'm completely paranoid <laughs> that I have them. So there's all these like, you know, got to hide them, put them in safes to back them up. Send, you know, it's just like a real crazy process. Even that part of it. Um, and then I will. Uh, what's the, what's the word? There it is, grade. I'll grade the photographs. So that's changing the color, changing the contrast. So I'll have to do that to hundreds of photos every night. And then I meta tag all the information from the scene into each photograph. So it's, um, you know, it's Jon Snow, it's episode 604, scene 78, J. You know, and I, I'll put that all in the information so that when we come to search the 1.2 million photos, all we have to do is search. Jon Snow episode 4 and all the images come up because if you tried to do it any other way with that amount of photos you've got to tag them in the beginning with a system um, so we can find them. And then they all go off, all the little photographs go off on their journey to New York and then I have to wait for a year to see where they're going to pop up. Actually the first, the first one in season one, the first photograph actually popped up on the billboard on the end of my house. So that was quite a nice moment. Had a little cry, texted my mum. And that, now it's just really interesting to see where they're going to end up because I'm not part of that side of things. I don't get to know where they're going to be or what they're going to be used on. You know, there's a lot of them in like mugs and things over in Comic Con, which is pretty exciting. Um, right, I'm just, I'm waffling now. Um, so, so basically, in my day, I have to please a lot of people. I have to, there's a lot of people who need photography from the show. 
there's uh, merchandising, there's advertising, there's, you know, a lot of people think that I take the continuity photographs. So it's like they think that I take the photos that show the certain way addresses for the next take, someone needs a photo, but that's actually another person who does that. That's um, Linda who does that, and Linda's got like five brains and can watch four monitors at once and take all that in. I'd be terrible at that job, so thank goodness I just take the photos. Um, so I've, I've said I have a lot of platforms to please, and so basically they are, the first thing that I have to do is obviously my main job is to cover the scenes. So that's like, um, I hope one comes up now, a good example, no. So a scene um, is basically just the actors, no crew, no sign that it's not a real place. So there, so she's Lady Olena, she's there, she's in her fantasy land and there's nothing that would break that fantasy for you. So that's the still, that's the still from the show. And then the next part of my job is the behind the scenes. So that's uh, recording the crew, um, all, all the workshops around the studio, our armory, which has its own blacksmith, which is kind of cool. Uh, go in and to the costume department where they're making all the beautiful costumes. You know, all, all of this kind of stuff, is, it has to be documented because it's, it's the legacy of the show, you know, it's going to be this documentation of it. And um, so I try and get as much of that behind the scenes as I can. Because you can watch the show forever and ever and ever, but it'll never illustrate to you all that interesting stuff that was going on behind the scenes. And I kind of, I think arguably that's my favorite part of the job because I get to put my stamp or my style on it. It's, it doesn't have to be so Game of Thrones. You know, it's like it, it can be my, my version, my vision of our crew, our big family there, and and all the things that are happening, maybe like little details that I feel like people should see, like the embroidery on some of the costumes, those little things that I get to see on a daily basis that I want everyone else to share. So that I think that's the most interesting part of my job is the document, doc, document part. Um, and then also, we have to produce um, posters. So you've got the one that, example I always use, because I think it was the one that people remember, is the big blue faces that were everywhere for a while. So those, um, they were shot on set, kind of during filming. And how that works is I have um, a studio with big, you know, flash kit and all that, and packs and a seamless background. and. So we'll carry that around in the van. And then just wherever we are, we've got, if, if we have, say, Cersei's in the right costume, the hair's good, she feels like doing it today, everything's working for us, but the only place to set it up is in like a stable, then you have to set it up in a stable. You just have to go in and get the floor reasonably clean and tidy first before you put your seamless down. And then that's where you have to shoot because you know, there's no time and there's no way. You can't have a nice, clean studio whenever you're working on this show. So you just have to make it work. You have to be able to think on your feet and set up anywhere. Be totally mobile. And um, so we'll do that maybe once a week. We'll shoot some cast in a studio environment. And it's literally, you know, five to ten minutes that you have them for. Like, they walk into, like, you know, Kit will walk into the studio, it'll be like, Hi, great, okay, be Jon Snow, blue steel, great, click, 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 and then they come and they drag him away again because they need him to, you know, go off and be heroic and do stuff. So, Jon Snow's a character in the show, not the newsreader, by the way, just for those of you who don't watch it. Um, <laughs> so, that's the photo shoot side of things. And then at the end of the entire season, I get to do the most fun thing of all. There was a photo that should have come up of like a, a team of people and someone's trying to hit me on the head with a sword. Did that come up already? So that's my little photo squad team at the end. And that is everyone's left the studio. They've all gone home, cameras are all gone. And we get to play with all the costumes 
and all the swords and all the props and we photograph them like museum pieces and that's really I can't tell you how much fun that is that is just the best thing ever I have tried on one of the costumes and uh, it's just it's nice to be able to do to photograph these objects like they are you know these amazing kind of artifacts because they are they're beautifully they're beautifully made they're beautifully crafted and I think it's important for them to be recorded so we really enjoy doing that so uh, that's the average day and I think the the pressure of getting those usable frames for so many people and so many platforms of so many different styles of uh, photography is it's a lot of pressure and I think it's just about finding a balance where you can very quickly switch between styles and um, you have to really be a jack or jill of all trades you know because you're going from documentary straight into landscape straight into a studio portrait environment and then into like product photography so you're doing all those different things on it and it's not even a daily basis it's, it's a minute to minute basis you're swapping into your different photography brains so it can be it can be quite a stressful few months because it's it's um it's relentless the crew work relentlessly you know it's the city you don't get kind of you come in and you're tired but you can't work at 70 percent it's got to be a hundred percent because we only do things once like when we set fire to dave the stuntman and throw him over the edge of the ship that happens once i can't be like oh, i'm a bit tired a bit tired didn't get it because you just know that's the shot they want to use is the guy on fire they're like okay we need that you send that still it's like oh so um you got to constantly be on 100 percent firing on all cylinders and um, so people people also ask me what skills do you need to be a photographer in the film industry i think um a lot of the skills are not photography based and i think there are skills that can be applied to lots of different types of photography weddings theater ever you know anything it's like you in certain things keeping keeping your distance i've already talked about that about being able to um think on your feet uh come up with solutions because it's like if you're shooting is anybody here do weddings right so weddings you know like certain things only happen once so if she's walking down the aisle and you have a lens problem you're going to want to fix that immediately because you can't say excuse me bride you wouldn't mind just going back and doing that again missed it you know you've got to think on your feet constantly um so that would be my uh what's what would that skill be then not panicking don't panic is a good skill kind of um being part of a team is a really important part of being in the film industry because you are crammed in a sardine tin of a set with about 70 other people um, and everyone's trying to do their best job everyone's trying to work at 100 percent and you have to respect that nobody's the most important person in the room everybody's doing their thing and everybody's job is important so i can't say excuse me boom guy this is my space i need to be here i need a photograph you have to negotiate it's like okay well if i go here on this one then can, you can go there on the next one and you have to kind of always be negotiating because everyone is important and on that note i think probably the the biggest thing and it's helpful in lots of different industries is being able to become somebody's best friend in about three and a half minutes so when they walk into your studio you have to be able to make them feel instantly at ease because not everyone even actors don't always like being photographed it's a different thing for them you know oftentimes so i have to find lots of different personalities within myself because this actor maybe likes me to be quiet and i have to learn that i have to listen to them listen to what they want and ask how they want it to go or someone else wants to be told you look great you're doing great it's amazing you know bomb fierce whatever you want to shout at them and then uh, someone else want maybe wants you to, to read some lines with them because they find it hard to be in character in a photo studio. So you've got to find all these different techniques to work with 400 different casts. That's good, isn't it? 
Um, so there's yeah lots of uh, lots of different things in, in terms of just the the vast array of personalities that you'll find on film set. So how what gear do you use? I use I've always used Nikon. I've always been Nikon ever since I stole my dad's camera when I was 11 to take on a school trip. And um, so, and because I just feel like I have tried other cameras in the past, and I just feel like my style is it's quite hard, it's quite contrasty. I like to push the images quite a bit, and I feel like the Nikon, just all that magical mystery stuff that they do inside with the chips and everything, it just suits my style. And so, every, all my bodies are Nikon, all my lenses are Nikon, and. At any given time, I will probably, in my cart, have four bodies with different lenses on them. And then the question is always, well, why do you need four? And it's because when you're standing in the middle of a battle and it's pouring with rain and there is muck flying up from all the horses that are running past, there is paper snow being pumped into the air which is like a fine papery mist floating. So that's our snow, or we have snow that's kind of made of like soap bubbles that floats. We also have uh, special effects people standing around with little cannons that are filled with fake blood and muck and all kinds of things. So they're getting fired off into the sea. Let's see. So all this stuff is flying through the air. The last thing I want to do is open up my lovely camera and fill it like a cup with all of this nonsense that's floating through the air. You just cannot change lenses in certain situations. Oh, but why don't you get a bag and change it inside a bag? I, I just don't have time for that. It's like uh, over the years, I started off with like one camera and three lenses, and that was in my little bag, and that was fine. But then over time, you've got to save up and you've got to invest in equipment bit by bit by bit. You know, and it's got to the point now where I have been able to do that and I can have the luxury of just grabbing. And, you know, they're not ever four of the most up-to-date camera. So I've got, I've got my, my ones that are my favorites. And um, at the minute for action, I'm loving, I'm loving the D5. It's my action camera. It's really, really good for stunts and all that kind of stuff. And just recently, has anybody got an 850? It's great, isn't it? It's absolutely beautiful. So I've just got an 850, and I am loving it for several reasons. I was on a night shoot last week, like I said, and I put on the 105, you know, the big, chunky, beautiful 105 lens. It's over there, you can probably play with it. Um, and I wasn't expecting to be able to get any decent images because it was so dark and the stunt that we were doing, I can't say what it is, but it was dark and it was difficult. And I, and I had that combo, I had the 850 with the 105 and I took a couple of pictures and I was zooming in on it and I was like, that is pin sharp. And it wasn't necessarily just down to me, it was like, it's, you know, a lot to do with that combo of camera and lens. It's so beautiful and performs so well in low light and I'm loving it. But the other thing is, now, on those four cameras, I have things called blimps. Does anybody know what a blimp is? It's like a horrible soundproof plastic case that you have to put your gorgeous camera in and lock it up, but it's to, it's to soundproof, so you can't hear the click. And then the next question is, why don't you go mirrorless? Why don't you do this, why don't you do that? But I don't want to swap out the great cameras that I have, so I have to use these plasticky boxes to put them in, although, they do protect me from the elements a little bit. They protect me from getting whacked with plastic swords during battles. So that's nice because that's happened on several equa equations. Just made up a word. Several occasions. So my blimps are, they're there for a reason. You'll see there'll be a photo of me with these big giant cameras that look like a Fisher Price, my first camera. So that's what those are. They're actually just housings. But on the silent thing, the 850, I can use on it silent mode. And that has been recently with what we've been doing. We've had a lot of cameras 
and there's not very many spaces for me to get in between to get a good angle. So what the what that's enabled me to do is because obviously I can't be clicking during a take when they're doing a big emotional monologue, you know, and I'm like, ka -choo, ka -choo. can't do that. So I've got my my 50, and what I can do is I can actually snake in between the cameras and kind of get an angle, and that's the first time. I've been able to do that because you're not very elegant with your big blimp, you know, kind of like, oh, I can't get in. So it's, it's made me um, more able to kind of squeeze into those places. And um, that's been lovely. I'm really enjoying <laughs> using that mode on it. But how we play with it, it's really brilliant. Um, uh, that's the last one. <laughs> so yeah. Um, what challenges do I face? So I've kind of, I've talked about a lot of challenges there. In fact, I think I've only talked about challenges, <laughs> just described how challenging it all is. Um, I think this, the scale of the project is the thing that I find the most challenging. It's art on an industrial scale and everywhere you look, there's something to shoot. So even when you feel like you want a little break and have a cup of tea, they're, you know, they're, they're dressing Dave up in his weird stunt suit, and you're like, oh, that looks cool, but I really want a cup of tea. You know, I'll shoot it. You know, so it's just this constant stream of 360 degrees of stuff that looks cool. But that's, that's a lot of, you know, it's a lot. Your brain's constantly taking in information, so that scale is massive. And I have to catch it all, get it all, no pressure. And uh, very long days, tough conditions, Loads of horse poo, <laughs> all, all of these fantastic things that make the day difficult. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of times when people will see a photo of me on set and they'll say, "But your gear is absolutely bogging, dirty." I don't know if people say, "Do you say bogging here?" <laughs> no, bogging means dirty. So the gear is absolutely bogging. It's covered in blood, mud, whatever snow ever's been flying through there and I'm I'm happy just as long as the front glass is clean because I just I don't have time to clean anything and I think that's my biggest challenge is just the environmental you know you see people laying cables through this muck all the camera team and then they're picking it up at the end of the day and everybody's just covered and then you think about it you've got to go home that night and you've got to clean that stuff and you've got to waterproof it again dry it on the radiator and then you're out the door at six in the morning again it's a relentless kind of um, cycle. Um, so my, my, my lovely assistant Trevor, who's brilliant and deserves a mention for putting up with me, he, um, he opened my camera bag once and just said, it's like a bag of roadkill and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so, because there was fur, there was blood, mud, the whole, the whole thing, because we're just like, oh, just don't have time to wipe it clean. Just clean the front, it's fine. We'll get through it. Um, so I think that's that's one of the challenges. I think people people try to have everything really perfect all the time, you know, have everything clean and swish, and sometimes it's just about getting the job done, you know, worry about cleaning it off later, it's fine. Um, I mean, obviously there are so many amazing things about this job. It's, really, it's, it's the job of a lifetime for a stills photographer. It's been 10 years of something that actually resembles a real job you know, working with the same people and the same theme and, you know, I've been so, um, so lucky to kind of wing my way into it and I'm, and I'm grateful for every day. I don't mean to sound like I'm complaining a lot, but it's just trying to explain the environment to you, but it's really the, the cast, the amount of different faces and personalities that I've had the chance to work with has really made me grow as a portrait photographer. I, I feel like I'm ready for anyone that could walk through the door now. You know, I could literally, I feel like I could work with anyone with any personality and I'd be like, oh, you're just like such and such. I know how to deal with this. You know, so it's, it's prepared me for the next thing. What's the next thing? Um, I don't know what the next thing is. That was, I've been asked that a lot over the last two days and I think the next thing is probably hibernation for about six months. Uh, to catch up on all the sleep we haven't had uh, it's probably be a good idea. Uh, and then I've written down, tell them what your favourite lenses are, because that was another question. Um, so, 
I'm talking very fast because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, my, my very favourite lens that I use the most, that I think I'd be lost without, is the 24 to 70. I love it. It's, for me, it's really, really versatile and, you know, with the scope of things, I can go wide, but I can also get that little bit tighter if I need to. So that, that's probably my favourite. And then my 85 1.4 for the studio, because I think it's just a gorgeous portrait lens and my all of a sudden new best friend, the 105 that helped me out last week. I'm, yeah, it's getting in the top three. So those are, those are my favourite lenses. Um, and I've talk, talked about the camera bodies. And I mean, like I say, I mean, I'm shooting thousands and thousands of frames and I am absolutely wrecking those cameras out in the field, the literal field. I am, I'm abusing them. <laughs> they're, they're getting knocked around and covered in muck out in the rain all day and they're standing up to the test. You know, and, and you know, that for me is just the absolute best thing is that I know I can kind of get away with it <laughs> with them. Um, do I have any advice for people who want to get into the industry? Does anyone want to get into the film industry? Okay. Run, run now. No. Um, <laughs> I think the advice for the film industry is it's not even so specific. My advice to you would be the same as to any other freelancer. It's that you can tick all the boxes, but it doesn't mean you're going to get phone calls. And I think that's the hardest thing to deal with when you're a freelancer. It's just one week it's all going great and you've got like five different jobs and you're really, you know, like you're totally smashing it. And then the line goes cold and you're thinking, well, what have I done wrong? Did I not Instagram enough? Did I not do this? Was that, did I not do a good job there? Was that, is somebody else come along who's better and the same thing? And so you're just this constant kind of not knowing where the next job's coming from or how you're going to get it. And I think um, that's the hardest thing as freelancers in such a competitive world. I mean, photography, everybody has a camera now. You know, it's got so competitive and um, I think you just have to remember that it's like, I keep saying this when I do talks, but it's not a ladder, it's a climbing frame, you know, and you're on the monkey bars or then you're at the bottom of the slide and you're lying in the mud and you're thinking, where did it all go wrong? It's doing so great on the monkey bars. So I think as long as you remember that and you're cool with that and you think it's fine, I'll just go around the back and I'll climb up again. And as long as you're fine with doing that, you, you'll get through it. But my advice is just stick at it talk to loads of people about your work, show loads of people your work to the point where you're bored of hearing about yourself. And, and because you never know who's going to be that producer who needs a photo of a clown for his movie. If you know what I'm saying, it's just like even the most unexpected thing could be your path in. So you just, um, you just have to stick at it and be okay with that. Right? Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Straight up. Let's karaoke. Do you just use the ambient light when you're shooting or are you allowed to use speed lights or the artificial light? Okay. In terms of light, this is about where I trip and embarrass myself on camera. Um, I use the light that cinematographer, I mean obviously this is out, outside and, or they'll, they'll have lit. For my documentary stuff, it's whatever I find. But I never ever use flash on set. Um, that would be career suicide. <laughs> but um, no, I never, I never use flash. Sometimes I, I carry around a little bounce, and sometimes I'll use that if, it, if it's just like a very backlit. I'll maybe kind of flip it. It's like it's a piece of polystyrene. Actually, I made it sound really fancy by calling it a bounce. It's a piece of polystyrene light that I got in B and Q for like a fiver. So. You know, sometimes I'll shape it a little bit. Obviously, when I'm doing my studio portraits, that's that's all, you know, the lighting that, that we have set up. It's not on set, it's off set in a stable or a cave or wherever we find a little space. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, like every day is just, it's a combination of all, but I never use speed lights on set. Uh, I don't even have one, I don't have one actually. 
<laughs> Any more questions? Oh, yeah. It's really the last series. Really, really. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, really, really. Um, someone asked me if there was going to be a book, and I'd love everybody to tweet HBO about that and say, hey, do you know what would be great, HBO? A book of Helen's photographs. Um, I'm on, I've just joined Instagram, so if you're on Instagram, I'm at Helen Stills, the app thing, and then Helen Stills. Um, so that would be cool if I could start my Instagram life here with all of you lovely people. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. I've got so many hard drives, it's a joke. I don't trust having one big hard drive because I keep thinking that'll be the one I drop in the bath. I don't know why I'd have it in the bathroom, but you know what I mean? It'll be like, you just think if it's all in one place, it'll surely burst into flames. Um, <laughs> so loads, tons of hard drives and all different types of hard drives actually. Because sometimes you trust one and then they let you down and then, you, yeah. So lots of different kinds. Any more customs? Yes, it's hard. To, so you asked in the battle scenes, is it really hard to avoid steady cams and things? And a steady cam is um, a camera that's not on a tripod. It's kind of attached to this weird Terminator thing that's on the cameraman, so they can kind of just get in the sword fight. That's graceful, wasn't it? Um, so there's steady cams, but there's also sound boom operators running in through there. There's focus pullers who are with the cameraman. So you're talking about, let's, let's just use the battle of the bad word. It's a bad word, can't say it. Um, so in, in the battle, you've got, you know, we're following Jon Snow, not the newsreader. So we're following Jon Snow, the character, and he's, you know, fighting this, chopping everybody up, but he's great and he's a hero. But there's a team of like 12 technicians following him around. So when I'm trying to get that great shot, you know, of him where he's like heroic and it's the right angle and I can see his face and he's not blinking and he's not making a weird scowl. That moment, I'm trying to shoot that through 12 people who are all going like this. Because they're all avoiding rubber swords. You know, we're all in the same boat. So to get that clean shot is a total nightmare, if I'm honest. It's really very frustrating, but it's nobody's fault. They're all doing their job. They're all avoiding the blood cannon explosions and the swords, and they're all trying to do their job at 100%. So it's just all about that teamwork, about moving a, like a swarm of bees or something. I don't know what you would describe it like. Pack of wolves, making it sound real. Yeah, moving like a swarm of bees all together <laughs> around the actor. Does that answer the question? Yeah, OK. Any more questions? Um, on some jobs, when you're the photographer, you just kind of show up and they haven't shared any information with you, like you haven't read the script because you're not allowed to, because you're only there for a day. Um, they just come on and, and say, right, we need Jack and Vera in the pub. They're having a fight. Convey that in photograph. You know, they just tell you that. But with this job, because I'm in so deep, now, after eight and a half years, I read the scripts, I read the schedule a thousand times, so I, I almost try and learn it, so I know that, okay, I can't get that today, but they are together again, four weeks down the line, and she'll be in a costume that's better for photographs. Do you know what I mean? So you try, I do in this job, but I don't, that's not really standard for a lot of jobs, but because, like I say, it's so much information on this and it's so difficult to navigate that I feel like I totally need to be on top of it all the time. I, I think, you know, I, I read the call sheet back to front just so I know because I hate the thought of missing anything. I just really like, and if I hear I've missed something that sounds cool, I'm like, oh, really? You know, like someone's been practicing cool horse you know when a horse goes like that, I don't know what that's called, but they've been practicing cool horse stunts in the car park and 
and you, you in your head you see the shot and you're like, oh, I can't believe I missed that. That would have been so fun. So yeah, I read it. I prepare a lot for this job specifically. Are there more questions? Yay! Oh. <laughs> Well, that's easy. You just sleep for five minutes every night, uh, and then you put in your spare eyes the next morning. <laughs> um, time, time management, I don't think I said that on the list of skills that you need. Uh, time management is really important, and pacing yourself, because you can sit and you can pour over a photograph, and oh, it's just, oh, it's just, but you've got to work quickly, and some things aren't perfect. There's a lot of things that aren't perfect to me, in these photos, but you just have to let it go because there's still a thousand photos to edit before Friday. You know, it's just, you just have to let some things go and keep keep working, keep working fast. So, does that, does that answer that? <laughs> is that, uh, hang on, I'm going to take a photo of all of you. Everybody say, yay! Yay. It was a video actually, haha, -ha, tricked you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's it. I'm done. You're free. Thanks very much.